Hey guys, welcome to The Remnant Radio. You're watching one of 19 episodes with Dr. Craig Keener, one of the preeminent Bible scholars on the planet, and we're talking about the Gospel of Mark. This is going to be an exciting episode. The connections that Dr. Keener put together while we were with him at Asbury Seminary, phenomenal. But man, it was an expensive trip to get all of us out there to film this content. But we want to give it to you for free. Well, we do want to give it to you for free, but... One of the ways that you can help offset the cost for this is by purchasing our home group material. Dawson, our researcher, has put together this material. There's a leader's guide. There is a participant's guide. So you you watch the video, you read the material, and then we walk you through. We have discussion questions that go along with it. It could be a huge blessing for you and your church. Yeah, and this would be perfect for tons of different mediums. Maybe you're a pastor uh, who's preaching through the Gospel of Mark, a home group leader, a Sunday school teacher. Uh, this would fit all of your needs. And if you want to pick this up, there's a link in the description for the home group material. In addition to that, maybe you're out there and you don't lead any kind of group like that. Uh, maybe you just want to contribute as a thank you to what we've put together here on Remnant. There's PayPal descriptions in the link of this video if you would like to uh, support us. So absolutely, click those links in the description, hit that subscribe button, and please enjoy this video with Dr. Craig Keener. Dr. Keener, help us walk through the narrative flow. What just happened in chapter 8 and how does this lead into chapter 10 with these stories? Yeah, actually at the very end of chapter 8, he's talking about when the Son of Man comes in his glory and not being ashamed before him. And then we're going to get a revelation of his glory. And the disciples, you know, I think they understand this is like a foretaste of an end time kind of event. And Jesus is telling them, don't, don't talk about this until after the resurrection. Well, after the resurrection, uh, they're like, wait, that's, uh, uh, that has something to do with Elijah supposed to come before the end time events, right? And he says, yeah, and well, that's already happened. And then he talks about his impending death and the disciples, uh, it, goes, it goes over their head um, every time when he does something like that. And they're arguing about who's the greatest. And he's, uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> before then, uh, these people are arguing about who's the greatest fail to cast out a, a <laughs> demon. <laughs> yeah, 14 through 29. Um, <clears throat> be, the, the, the impetus of needing faith, you know, the public reproof seems to be more for the guy who's asking for the miracle, but really when Jesus says about uh, uh, unbelieving generation, you know, it's going to come. It's going to come around to the disciples. They'll ask him in private. They don't want to be ashamed. But then uh, he takes a child and shows this is the you know the greatest is the least. That's that's the way of the kingdom. And he's going to have to come back to that in chapter ten, verses thirteen to sixteen, when the disciples don't want the little children to come to, come to Jesus. They're into the big stuff. They don't want the little stuff. And so. They need the object lesson again. It's not just the, the two feedings, you know, it's everything. They seem to need it twice. And uh, it's going to go on to a rich ruler who's, you know, so the big people versus the little people. And Jesus is with the, the little people. So then at the uh, end of verse one, he mentions, you will see the kingdom come in power. Mm -hmm. Well, how would they have understood that? I think they would have understood it as, you know, the fullness of the kingdom, the consummation of the kingdom. He's just been talking about, because there's no chapter breaks in the original, and it's kind of artificial trying to summarize it chapter by chapter, but um, he has just been talking about the Son of Man coming in glory. So that's what they're expecting, and there's something to do with that. But then they see him in glory, well, three of them do, takes him up on the mountain, his, his most intimate disciples, and I think that's a foretaste of the future glory, but that's the one that they get while they're still alive. Because he says, um, you know, this will happen before. Uh, you know, some of you, some of you will will still be alive when this happens. It's like, but for the transfiguration, how can it be just some of some of them? Mm -hmm. Well, probably the point was that some of them would see <laughs> rather than the rather than the others, and. Uh, I mean, obviously, they didn't live until the second coming, until the Son of Man's coming in the fullness of his glory. But some of them did get to see this prefiguring. And all three Gospels that mention that saying, in all of those three Gospels, it's immediately followed by the transfiguration. What's, what's the significance of the transfiguration? I mean, we've got some pretty big figures on the mountain with Moses and Elijah. 
Yeah. And then Jesus is three favorites, you know, Peter, James, and John. Yeah. Yeah. You've, you've got, um, you've got the six days in one of the narratives. You've got uh, the cloud overshadowing. You've, you've got the mountain setting. Uh, all of that fits Moses on the mountain receiving a theophany of God's glory, which is what you, you know, you have a foretaste of that in chapter six. Well, now you have it again in chapter nine, but this time they actually see some of the glory. And the two, the two figures from the Old Testament who appear here are Moses and Elijah. Although he mentions Elijah first, interestingly, maybe because he's going to go on and discuss Elijah you know, in 11 to 13 or whatever. But when, um, when you have Moses and Elijah there, they had some things in common. Some people think that it's Moses and Elijah is representative of the law and the prophets. Um, but why Elijah particularly, why not a different prophet, you know, like Acts chapter 3, Samuel and all the prophets or something. Others think it's it's Moses and Elijah um, because, well, actually this one probably has something to it. People were expecting a new Moses, Deuteronomy 13, sorry, Deuteronomy 18, and they were also expecting Elijah to come before the day of the Lord. So here's literal Moses and literal Elijah, but they're bearing witness together mm -hmm. to Jesus. And notice also Moses and Elijah were the ones who had the revelations, the theophanies on Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. Yeah. yeah. Well, then they also hear uh, the voice of the Lord speak. Mm -hmm. And this is the second time we've heard God say these words, and the second time God has spoken audibly from heaven, first at the baptism, now here on the mountain. What are we to make of that? And is there a connection between the two? Oh, yeah, there's definitely a connection. But it's the it's our second time to hear, but it's the disciples' first time to hear. Mm. Uh, they oh, they weren't there. After the baptism. They weren't there at the baptism. Right. And at the baptism, it's not clear from Mark that anybody heard it except Jesus. Mark, Mark doesn't make it explicit that anybody else heard. So, um, yeah, the, the three closest disciples get the revelation here. And it's interesting that, you know, they're, they're like in awe, wow, this is Moses and Elijah and, and Jesus. They're with Jesus. Look how big Jesus is, our, our Jesus. Let's build three tabernacles up here. And the, the language of building tabernacles, it's similar to like the tabernacle in the wilderness. Um, and what they're not getting is that the tabernacle belongs to the holy place of, of God. And Jesus alone is the one to be worshipped. Moses and Elijah are there to bear witness to Jesus. It's not that they're the great ones. And so, uh, you know, just like Moses and Elijah saw the glory, they're getting to see the glory. And so after Peter says that, then the cloud overshadows them, and Jesus is there alone. And then God says, listen to this one. This one is my son. So Jesus is above Moses. He's above Elijah. Um, some people also point out that in Deuteronomy 18, 18, 18, 15, and 18, 18, um, uh, this, this prophet... Uh, who's who's coming like Moses? Him you shall hear, you should listen and to. it's the same yeah. same uh, phrase in Greek is in the Greek translation of Deuteronomy. Yeah, it's, that's fascinating. So they have this experience with Jesus, and then they come down off of a mountaintop, and the stuff is going down. Right, mm -hmm. you've got a guy. I guess the disciples of Jesus, mm -hmm. the remaining disciples, trying to cast out a demon, mm -hmm. and they can't. Uh, father looks to Jesus and says, if you can, mm. can you do something here? Uh, how does that fit into the larger narrative of Mark? Well, earlier in 140 to 45, you've got a leper who comes to Jesus begging him, saying, if you will, I know you can. Mm. And so the, the question, if he wills, is there, and Jesus says, I do will, be cleansed. But this guy is saying, if you can, and maybe the failure of the disciples has actually contributed to his uncertainty, but he's not sure about Jesus' power. 
to be able to make a difference in this big case. So then when Jesus responds and says, if you can believe, yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of a way of putting it back on him, right? Yeah, grammatically, it's like Jesus says, if you can, exclamation point, if you can believe, mm -hmm. all things are possible to the one who believes. <laughs> okay, so he says, help my unbelief, right? I believe, but help my unbelief. What's the significance of that? Because um, over and over in, I guess, Mark, he's already told people, you know, just believe, only believe multiple times, like with Jairus' daughter and, and the woman with the issue of, not with the woman with the issue of blood, but in, in those narratives, you have she, these, she, like, she, she, only she did believe, though. That's right. So so how, how does that fit in here where he's like, I, I kind of-ish? Well, you know, <laughs> yeah, what kind of faith does that believe -ish? show? Believe-ish. <clears throat> Well, I mean, it took faith for him to bring the son to Jesus. I mean, he didn't have to tear up a roof or anything, but, you know, he's already demonstrated, he's already acted in faith to some degree. But in terms of help, help my unbelief, okay, if, if this faith isn't enough, do something for my unbelief, and Jesus actually does by healing his son. Um, but, you know, in Nazareth, you have deliberate, defiant unbelief. Sometimes, though, I think we are like like this guy. Well, Lord, I've prayed about this before. It hasn't happened. And, and we're not sure if we're supposed to be persistent like the Syrophoenician woman uh, or, you know, the, the friends who let their paralyzed friend down the, the roof. Or if it's like, well, Lord, ah, it's hard for me to, to believe you for this. I, I feel like you're not going to do this because you haven't done it so far. Um, sometimes I think we're like him. And we need to be reminded, it just takes a mustard seed. It's not how big our faith is, it's how big is the God in whom is our faith. And that he can doesn't need to be a question. But Jesus isn't limited. You know, in the case of Nazareth, it was defiant unbelief. But in a case like this, Jesus isn't limited by the man having some ambivalence. Now, the boy that was suffering, we... we read a little bit about his condition not, being not not that we should be ambivalent but i'm just saying sure um don't put your faith in how much faith you have put your faith in the in person the, because faith is about the faithfulness of the one in, in whom we trust so sometimes we you know we put our faith in our faith and that's that's just, faith is only as good as its object well god is the perfect object come on that's good would you equate the faith in faith to psychological certainty is that what you mean by that? Yeah, or trying Just to work up a up. feeling. Yeah. yeah, which is basically make believe. Right. That's not what faith is about. It's not. A, it's not a, a leap in the dark. Um, all that's in the like the development of modern philosophy and so on. But it's a deliberate step into the light of God's truth. And that step for for this man was just bringing the boy to Jesus. Yeah. And and the boy is suffering. It says that he has fits. He falls to the ground. He, he throws himself into the fire. Um, what's going on with that? Is that epilepsy? Is that what we would, or is there something more going on there? It looks, it looks a lot like epilepsy and ancient descriptions of epilepsy also, also fit that. Uh, a lot of people in antiquity thought epilepsy was caused by spirit. They just uh, assume. Or spirits. A, a lot of them did. Now, uh, one of the Hippocratic uh, physicians wrote a, a treatise on the sacred disease, arguing that epilepsy is not caused by a spirit and not caused by a god. It's just a natural thing. And we do know that epilepsy, you know, there's, there, there's something in the brain that causes it. It's a physical uh, ailment. Uh, but you, you also think um, Matthew speaks of this and describes it that way. But Matthew, I think 424 or so, also differentiates epilepsy. Also differentiates epilepsy from uh, other. Uh, it, it di differentiates it from from demonization, and you see in Luke chapter thirteen a woman who's been bent over for eighteen long years. Well, she's got a physical problem, but in that case, it's caused by a spirit. So <laughs> spirits can cause psychological problems. Um, they can cause other problems. I mean, the human person is not built to have more than one person inside it. Um, but 
They also can cause physical problems. But that doesn't mean every case of that physical problem is caused by a spirit. It just means if the spirit latches onto a certain part of the anatomy, uh, like the central nervous system, it can it can cause uh, some things that can also be caused by other things. Excellent. So why couldn't the disciples cast out this demon? What would make this demon different? Yeah, that's what they ask. Uh, of course, they ask him in private. They don't want to be shamed in public. But when they get to private, they say, why couldn't we cast it out? You know, they've been casting out demons before, but Jesus says this kind comes out only by prayer. So there seem to be different kinds, different levels. And, you know, obviously the legion is a pretty powerful demon in chapter 5. Jesus didn't delegate that one. This one is, is pretty powerful too. But the implication is you guys, e either he's saying you need to stop there and pray for a while, or he's saying you ought to have been prayed up beforehand. Because he's already attributed part of the problem to unbelief. You know, when he speaks of the unbelieving generation, he says that right after the the guy says, I brought I brought my son to your disciples and and they could not cast it out. That's why he asked Jesus, I think that's why he asked Jesus, uh, if you're able. So uh, faith and prayer go together also in eleven twenty two through twenty four, twenty five. Um, so I I think he's he's saying, you know, you need to have a life of prayer and faith, um, faith in the one who's faithful, trust in the one who's trustworthy, reliance in the one who's reliable. Um, and they uh, hopefully learn the lesson. Right after this, though, they, they start talking about who's the greatest after they just failed to cast out a demon. Right. What do we make of this? This is like a second time now where they are, yeah. their concern is more about their own reputation, their own status. Yeah. And, and remember, three of them weren't there to fail. Three of them were on the top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. you know? So they may be like, well, we're the greatest. You guys just failed. And the other guys yeah. may be pushing back. Uh, but then, you know, Peter, Peter was one of the three on the mountain, but he had just gotten rebuked in the previous chapter. So you can see how they're jockeying for position. But the irony is they're starting to act just like the elites that have been having mm -hmm. conflicts with Jesus. So Jesus has to correct them and give them a very anti-elite example. So you, get, you talked about this earlier, about the there's like the inside group and the outside group, and you get you get this knowledge because you're the inside group, and the outside group is these elites and these kind of like higher ups, but they start actually thinking of themselves as like, oh, we're something special. We have the secrets, yeah. we have the access, and they actually become the elites that are on the outside and, and Jesus has to bring them back in. Yeah, it's like, okay, you're going to set up the kingdom. And even though I was a nobody, you know, in the eyes of the world, um, wow. you chose me. And so you didn't choose me just because you love loved me, even though I'm a nobody. No, you chose me because I'm so special and so great mm. uh, that I, I'm going to be the viceroy. Or I'm going to be I'm going to be the uh, Secretary of State or the Secretary of War or whatever. Mm. Shame. So you kind of see this temptation to get a head on your shoulders because of whatever you're experiencing with Jesus, and failing to recognize who the who the power belongs to. I mean, sometimes even when we look down on not not just other believers, we're competing with other believers, but we look down on non-believers. What were we saved by? We're saved by grace. We, we, we shouldn't be looking down on anybody. I mean, some of them have never had the opportunity that, that we've received. And, mm -hmm. and so when we're bringing them good news, it's not us speaking down to them. It's, it's somebody who's just been saved from a fire, pulling somebody else out of a fire. You know, anyway. Well, so they, they fail to cast out the demon. They argue about being the greatest. And then they're upset when somebody else is successful at casting out a demon. And saying, hey, that, that, those people aren't with us. They're not one of us. Just kind of like what happens with Moses and the elders. Before we go to that, um, Jesus gives an example of the least among them. Oh, right. And, th and that's a, you know, child. It's a child. And that's going to be significant because, you know, today, I mean, you have companies, they market to children watching cartoons or they, you know, they market on social media to children. Well, 
there weren't anybody marketing to children in, in antiquity. I mean, one third of, probably close to one third of, of children who were born never lived to adulthood in antiquity. Oh, wow. And so... Um, precious commodity. They were a precious commodity, but they also had no social status. Mm -hmm. And if you want to take an example of somebody with no status and say, this is the greatest, the, the least is the greatest, children would be the ones. And he, and he also compares his disciples then to children. You know, Don't cause one of these little ones to stumble. Better to have a millstone hung around your neck than, and, and cast into the sea. Now, that was one of the most extreme Roman punishments, obviously, was crucifixion. That was probably the death by slow torture, probably the most extreme. But another one was tying somebody up in a, in a sack with, uh, like if they were guilty of killing one of their parents or something, tying them up into a sack with a scorpion and a snake and a cat or something like that, and then throwing them into the river Tiber or throwing them into the sea. Oh, and if you want to make sure they sink really fast, tie a millstone around it. And, and Jesus doesn't just use the word for, you know, the regular kind of millstone that, that women would use. They'd spend hours a day sometimes grinding the, grinding the grain. But this was the community millstone that was, that was turned by a donkey. So this is a large millstone. You drop them quick. It did drop them quick. So you're gonna, it's, it's not gonna take as long as crucifixion, but it's gonna be agonizing death, and that of course leads into some of his other descriptions why it's better never to have been born than to suffer some of these other things he's gonna talk about. But so, I, I I interrupted you. No, 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 no. This is the question about the demons. Yeah, well, the disciples they fail at casting uh -huh. out a demon. They talk about being the greatest, and then they're upset when somebody else is successful. Yeah, but notice it's it's J James and John, well, especially John here who brings this up. He was in the mountain, so he he had, he wasn't one of the people who failed. Uh, uh huh. <laughs> so he can he can he thinks he can he can do that, and Jesus Jesus goes kind of easy on him, but he's going to get rebuked more in chapter ten because <laughs> John and James are going to come back with this again. Um, about wanting to be the greatest, but you know, this guy doesn't follow us. No, normally when the Gospel of Mark uses a kalutheo, follow, it's about following Jesus. But John doesn't say we rebuked him because he's he we we hindered him because he's he's following, uh, not following you. He said because he's not following us. He the guy's doing it in Jesus' name but he's not part of their group. And Jesus says, you know, you really can't afford to <laughs> throw away potential allies. And the one who's not against us is for us. And, you know, this guy's doing it in my name. And Jesus has been talking about, you know, a cup of cold water in the name of a disciple. He's been talking about um, anyone who, who causes the stumbling of one of these little children who believes in my name. Well, what is John doing? You know, in, in this language for hindering comes up again when the disciples want to hinder children being brought to brought to Jesus. So this is, the disciples are in a pretty serious learning curve here. Yeah, last little passage here he's talking about. It's the first time we see hell being introduced by Jesus, Gehenna mentioned there. Can you explain some of that for us? Because it's it's on the, the tail end for people chronologically tossed into a body of water because you cause one of these little ones to stumble. Then he just starts talking about, man, if, if your hand causes you to stumble, chop that thing off. Help us yeah. understand that. Yeah, so earlier you had um, this spirit casting the boy into water and mm. into fire. Now Jesus is going to be talking about, y you want to hear really about being cast into water and cast into fire? Here's, here's some real stuff about it. Oh, wow. So um, in the case of Gehenna, the, the, the term means literally the Valley of Hinnom. And it was commonly used by this period in Jewish literature. Uh, Gehinnom was contrasted with Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, which was named for paradise. And in the afterlife, um, many Jewish teachers said, you'll either go to the Garden of Eden or you'll go to Gehen Gehinnom. Uh, Gehinnom was where children were burned in the Old Testament. Uh, in sacrifices to Moloch. Oh so it has some nasty uh, imagery 
um, associated with it. But especially it was, it was thought to be a, a place of, of judgment, a place of torment. There actually were different Jews, uh, Jewish views on it. One view was the wicked would go there and be burned up instantly. Another was that they would be tortured for a time and then either destroyed or released. And then another view was that um, they would be tortured eternally. So uh, Jesus, well, in the Gospels where it gives us any indication, it sounds like it's eternal. So like John the Baptist in, in Matthew 3 and in Luke chapter 3, you know, burning with unquenchable fire. Uh, chaff normally burns up quickly, but this chaff was going to burn with unquenchable fire. Anyway, it's whatever view you take, it's really not something you would want to experience. Jesus says, better to have your, your hand cut off. Uh, by the way, corporal punishment, cutting off appendages was, was used in some cultures, uh, especially more to the east. And if, you're, if your hand causes you to stumble, if you trip over your hand, cut it off rather than that causing you to stumble. We just talked about causing the little, little children to stumble, uh, which there are plenty of people who do those things today, and we could talk about potential applications, but, um, or, or causing one of the disciples to stumble as well. But if, if something in yourself causes you to stumble, cut it off. And he gives the specific examples of eye, hand, and foot. You could trip over your foot or your eye could cause you to trip. Uh, stumbling, by the way, was also often used as a reference to sinning or apostasy. It's actually used that way in, in Mark chapter 4 already. So better to, uh, to do anything, you know, lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be cast into Ghana. So drawing on Daniel 12 2, there'll be a resurrection to to eternal life, and there'll also be a resurrection to e eternal shame. And you, you know, you're going to get resurrected one way or the other. Your body is going to either be a new body, like, like Jesus' body. The resurrection is affirmed in chapter 12 and so on. But this here is the resurrection of the damned, who are cast into Gehenna. And, you know, people debate about is this literal? Is this symbolic? Whatever it is, again, you don't want to. You don't want to be there. Yeah. If Jesus says better to lose one of your appendages, it was also believed that when people would be resurrected, they would be resurrected. Well, some people believe the rabbis. Some of the rabbis talked about it. It's also in Second Baruch, which is a bit later. But um, these these sources talk about the person being resurrected in the same form in which they died first, and then they'd be healed, just so you'd know it was the same person uh, on, on both ends of it. Um, resurrection was also associated, the resurrection of the righteous had long been associated with martyrs, like in, in Second Maccabees and, uh, and, and so on. So they might have their appendages cut off, but it'd be all right, because they, they, they looked ahead to the resurrection. But you know, if you have your appended, well, if you have your whole body and you go into hell, uh, that's yeah. The, the contrast it'd be better, is better. It'd piece be better to hobble into. Thing. It'd be better to hobble into heaven than to burn the holy whole thing. in hell. Yeah, yeah, I got it. That's that's great. Thank you so much for that, and and thank you for walking us through uh, Mark nine. Is there now, anything you really want to end on on that note? I mean, that's a kind of dismal note. I mean, do you have a, do you have an upbeat sort of? Uh, do you want me to do you want me to give you a hand? Make oh, a, uh, uh, that are was, you sure you don't have your foot in your mouth? Anyway, uh, I was eyeing that one. But anyway, uh, no, this is uh, gold. Yeah, there, there's some people who actually think those three parts. They, there's a passage they compare in the Talmud, but you know the Talmud is written later. Obviously, Jesus' disciples hadn't read the Talmud, even if, even if it had been written already. I don't think they would have read it. So, but there is a passage in Proverbs that talks about sinning with these different body parts. And so, you know, I think Jesus is just giving examples with that. But let's see. To get on a more pleasant note, we can tell him to stay tuned for chapter 10 
I hope you've enjoyed that episode on the Gospel of Mark with Dr. Craig Keener. If you want to go back and watch former episodes that we've done, there's a playlist right here, uh, or you can watch the very next chapter, which will be listed right here. If you've been blessed by this episode or other episodes we've done, consider giving. There are links in the description. 